introduction. And, um, and also thank you for being there because I know it's a, it's a graveyard shift and it's always tough for the post lunch session to be there and stay. Um, so without wasting further time, I would like to wish all of you a very good afternoon uh, for being present here. And also I would like to, at the very outset, would like to extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude to Bhargava Vidas and, and the entire team who just, I think, for really conceptualizing this event around the various challenges uh, of decolonizing the academia. And, and I, I personally feel that uh, such forms of discourses are so specifically important, especially uh, within the academic spaces uh, that are located in the Global North, because uh, where we usually see that the curricula, the pedagogical patterns are, you know, still continue to be widely driven by the parameters of uh, white, heteropatriarchal, colonial, and uh, Euro-North American-centric systems of knowledge production. Uh, and and I, I feel that you know, strongly these events uh, open up so many uh, gateways. It opens up multiple gateways between the scholars from Global North and Global South to engage in discussions, agreements, uh, disagreements, but also at the same time uh, charter you know, base forward towards towards decolonizing the academic systems across the globe, and that's what we have been uh, trying to do from different perspectives uh, since morning today, and very hopefully we will continue with this sort of conversation tomorrow and much beyond that as well. Now, what I'm going to do in the course of uh, next 35 to 40 minutes is uh, what I'm trying to talk about, obviously that the topic is not mentioned here, but as, as Bhargavi mentioned, that the topic centers on the question of fractured pedagogies. And widely what the topic engages with is uh, with this whole sort of idea of shifting uh, the grammar of colonial pedagogies in the educational institutions. And, and what I mean by the shifting of shifting the grammar of colonial pedagogies will obviously be unpacked in due course of time. And also, I would like to clarify that what I mean by the educational institutions is not just the higher educational institutions, but also the schools as well. So it's schools and higher education institutions, any other form of education institutions. Uh, and, and how would I like to engage with this whole sort of idea of shifting the grammar of colonial pedagogies? Uh, I'm going to interrogate certain terms and phrases uh, which has been which have been either systematically uh, stigmatized uh, and demonized or have been exclusively interpreted from very specific Eurocentric vantage points. Uh, obviously, I mean, within this time frame, it is not possible to engage with a lot of terminologies and phrases, so very categorically, I have selected three particular words, uh, stupidity, uh, silence, and common sense. And why I have selected? Because it again comes from very personal positionalities uh, of being a, a student, uh, a researcher in India, from India, and obviously I'm going to cite examples from Bhutan as well, uh, where I have worked for some period of time, and 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 also my experience as a student, especially uh, where uh, you know based on these three words, since as a child I have observed closely how based on th these three words, you know. A, a level of students' intelligence will be classified that who is more intelligent, who is more meritorious, who is less intelligent, who is a good student, who is a bad student, etc. And these three words will actually feature very prominently in such forms of constructing, such forms of problematic hierarchies, problematic discourses. So specifically, uh, I have chosen these three words and based on that actually I have written uh, I, I did a pedagogy trilogy uh, as well, and I, I started with the pedagogy of the stupid, then it went to performative silence, and I have just put it here in case if you'd like to look up to, uh, you know, in your, in your, uh, for the sake of reading, please go for that, and this is going to be published soon, so I'll put that in the academia uh, very soon as well. Uh, now, as I said, uh, that this particular uh, presentation, the, 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 the whole sort of arguments, you know, this actually comes from very personal experiences and, uh, and it, it starts actually from very personal, so I'm going to share a lot of personal narratives and intertwining them with the wider problem. So, when I was three years old, uh, I was actually diagnosed with the neurological disorder of epilepsy. Uh, and, and this disease 
actually uh, those who are a bit familiar with this disease, uh, they must be knowing that actually leads to multiple forms of uh, physical and psychological complications like uh, obesity, uh, lethargy, uh, stammering, uh, and, and there could be many other problems as well. And uh, obviously, I was affected by all these, and, and some of these problems I continue to encounter even today as well. Now, what happened, you know, uh, especially due to my issues with obesity and stammering, uh, you know, what happened, I very easily became an object of uh, ridicule and mockery, you know, in my locality, in my school where I studied. Uh, and, and also it was known to the school tutors as well that I had epilepsy because I required special treatment and care with respect to medicines and all. But the problem what it actually needed to was that I was treated with extra sympathy and care. And I put the words extra sympathy and care within quotations because uh, to, to highlight the fact that under that mask of extra sympathy and care, what was happening was to systematically uh, silence, otherize, marginalize, and to a vast extent, demonize my presence and participation, let us say, in a classroom as a, as a student. Um, to, to elaborate further, because I had various forms of physical and psychological um, issues, I was regarded as incapable to think, analyze, question, and share my opinions. And every time, uh, I proved them wrong, so when I mean them, it's a selective group of teachers and classmates. Um, every effort was made from this side to silence me by saying that um, I am stupid, I am someone who lacks common <coughs> sense, uh, and I am someone for whom being silent is the best, being silent is the best way to, to, to exist. Now, since my childhood days, the thing is, rote learning was never my cup of tea. Uh, and obviously, rather questioning every forms of ideas, every forms of academic disciplines, and every forms of subject areas that were taught <coughs> uh, in our schools was a way of gaining knowledge from, for me. So questioning has always been a very important part of my learning. So learning through questioning. And I have always been resistant to the very dictation and note-making pedagogical pattern, which is still very common in the Indian classrooms. And have always been inclined to uh, you know, understanding and interpreting uh, the different subjects in my own ways. And what would happen is when I, when I would like to interpret, often my, my interpretations would be actually very inconclusive, uh, would be very abstract, would be very non-linear, unlike what is expected from us is like a fixed set of conclusions, fixed set of statements, a final proposition, and then the story is over. It would never be like that for me. Um, and as a result, what would happen is my interpretations on a lot of occasions would be in conflict uh, with the interests of the teachers who always uh, you know, expected the students to replicate the notes as dictated to them in the classroom. So obviously, again, I was ridiculed as oversmart. I was ridiculed as stupid. I was ri ri uh, ridiculed as someone who is arrogant and obviously was regarded as someone who is trying to act as able despite not being socioculturally fit for that because I have a neurological disorder so I'm expected to not be able to think as I mentioned earlier. Now later on, you know, uh, these sort of uh, very problematic experiences later on actually uh, provoked me to think like when I emerged as a researcher, I, I became a school teacher, eventually I started teaching in colleges and then currently as a postdoctoral fellow, these sorts of experiences, you know, uh, kind of made me realize that the pedagogical approach has not changed much over the course of time. Like for instance, I have like, you know, when I went to teach, I could see my colleagues implementing the same form of violence on the students. As a researcher, I could see how colleagues and supervisors and professors unleash the same form of violence on <coughs> students. And such experiences provoked me to socio-historically, socio-culturally investigate you know, the various factors um, that actually contributed towards systemizing this very abusive 
closeted and dictatorial pedagogies within the Indian education system that how it has got so normalized and naturalized over generations. Um, and I need to go back to a little bit backwards. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to talk much about that because it's out there everywhere, but still I need to contextualize. So I would like to briefly talk about the, the European colonization of the education system in India. And what we see was, obviously, I mean, prior to the beginning of European colonization, if we have some sort of idea of the Indian education system, we will see that, uh, obviously, to a vast extent, not completely, to a vast extent, was quite universal, multi-directional, it was de-hierarchical, it was dialogic in nature. I mean, obviously, I mean, it doesn't mean we, we all know that pre-colonial education system actually had encountered a lot of challenges in terms of cla uh, caste, class, gender, race, and geographies, those challenges were already there. Uh, I mean, in the, even in the pre-colonial education system as well. But also, I mean, uh, but still, you know, there were scopes of interrogation. There were scopes of places where, if you especially look closely into the education patterns of the native indigenous communities uh, there in India in the pre-colonial era, questioning. Uh, de -hierarchy, de hierarchically uh, spreading knowledges amongst each other, sharing knowledges with each other was quite a common practice. Um, and actually, I mean, we, we, uh, for instance, I know uh, while working with this particular trilogy, I did work closely with uh, some of the indigenous communities from whom I, actually I have friends, uh, like the Coles, the Bhils, the Shautas, like they're based in different parts of India, somewhere in some in the western part, some in the eastern part, uh, some in the lower eastern parts. And um, when I closely talked to them, interacted with them, tried to understand their education system, how it has been working traditionally, what is really fascinating is that, you know, within their educational environment, you know, a, a child is always encouraged to ask questions. Uh, instead of, you know, uh, imposing the predetermined notions of the elders on the children, a child is always encouraged to ask questions. Like questioning is a very important part of their pedagogical pattern. Uh, without questioning, there are no responses. And also, uh, what is also really important to see that Within these communities, uh, when we talk about the notion of common sense, you know, this is again a very problematic concept. We expect people that they should know something by common sense. And we, and again, if we very critically engage with this whole phenomenon of common sense, which is again very Eurocentric in nature. Because, for instance, I remember, again, I will talk about elaborately a bit later on as I, as I move ahead, you know, go ahead with my, with my paper, um, that where uh, we see that, you know, I, I remember as a child, if I was unable to tell something of Shakespeare, because I, I'm from the literary background, so I'm citing examples from there, uh, like about Shakespeare or John Kitts or P.B. Shelley or any other so-called globally established poets, then, you know, people will often, like, kind of, reject my capability of being a part of the English literary field because it's a common sense that if I have to be a decent, acceptable student of English literature, I should know these people. Without knowing these people, I cannot be a student of English literature. So, you know, but for these communities, you know, common sense is perceived in diverse contexts in a, in a, in a very multi-dimensional way. They don't expect that certain ideas has to be imposed on them as common sense and reject other set of ideas. And, and which, is, which is very unlikely of the mainstream education system because what we see is we expect that, we, that singular forms of common sense need to be there within us, which are kind of appropriated, patented, indoctrinated, and sanctioned by the West. Um, and, and their ways of understanding knowledge is through common sense are also through habitual life experiences, uh, which is again a very important part of having a kind of fractured pedagogy, what I refer to as not something which is very linear, which is hierarchical, which is singular, which is unidirectionally structured, but also the life experiences where 
we spontaneously learn from our respective diverse spaces and diverse experiences. Now, uh, because I mean, silence is another another important you know part of this uh, of this whole conversation. Uh, it is also important to note very briefly. Uh, I I won't be going much long because you know we're just running out of time. But very briefly to mention that you know uh, silence is another very important part of these communities. And what I mean by these is these indigenous communities to learn. You know, uh, again, if I Remember that uh, what happens, you know, for, for these children, when I was interacting with the community's mem members, they say that these children, how do they learn with nature, learn with slash from nature? It is about, you know, they learn about the techniques of nature, obviously not from a set of science books and geography books and environmental studies books. I mean, they are supposed to wake up early in the morning and walk silently to the forest, listen to the bird calls, listen to the wind, listen to the sky, listen to the water, listen to the air, and that is how they learn how the nature shifts, how the nature transforms, the attitude, the language of the nature. And which I, I personally found is like super powerful. And we have ample examples across the world. I mean, I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, one very uh, small example, uh, you know, which I, I can immediately is coming in my mind is when that that severe tsunami attack took place uh, quite a few years back in India. So, you know, uh, in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, uh, obviously, obviously the people who were there near the beaches, you know, when those massive waves were coming, people never had any idea it was, you know, it, it was a kind of tsunami. So basically they were having fun there. They were filming that. And then later on those people were washed away. But it is in the same area, uh, quite interestingly, you know, the, the tribal communities like the Jarabas, you know, immediately, you know, they sensed something is wrong and they ran deep into the forest. And that is why their entire community got saved. Because through the receding of the waves, through understanding the sudden stop of the bird calls, through looking at the wind speed, they could immediately sense that a severe natural calamity is about to take place, a severe form of violence about to take place. So I mean, there are, and this is just one example of so many, several examples we can have to show that how, you know, learning with silence, learning in a silent way with nature, beyond the, you know, the mainstream so-called degree-centered way of learning from the textbooks can also lead to very practical forms and very relevant and practical uh, practical forms of knowledges as well. Now, uh, you know, what happens that when we listen to these instances, and this is, this is also coming up from today morning conversations as well, we often wonder that, yes, okay, fine, uh, you know, these instances are so practical, we also see you know, they are being applied in different contexts, but uh, the obvious question comes that, you know, uh, how do we, you know, uh, how, how much practically relevant, you know, are these pedagogical patterns? Uh, for instance, let, let us call silence, let us call uh, the question of uh, common sense or what we call the question of stupidity. I will talk more about the stupidity, why do I talk stupidity as we go on. Uh, how they're practically relevant, especially, you know, at the end of the day, they are all sitting within mainstream institutions. We are trying to generate resistances within mainstream institutions. And obviously, we know that we need to think within mainstream institutions that how to practically generate resistance. It is not always possible for us just to, you know, leave everything and, and just go away somewhere else. Um, and for that reason, what I, uh, what I wish to do is, um, I want to cite very two specific examples. There are a ample of examples again that how do these forms of pedagogies can work within mainstream educational spaces as well, and how they have been adopted and what impact it is creating. So with respect to that, I'll cite two examples. Uh, one is with respect to the green school system of Bhutan. Uh, which was launched in 2006 uh, by the government of Bhutan. And another is uh, the very interesting, it's called the Happiness Curriculum, uh, which was launched by the Education Ministry of New Delhi in 2019. Now, let, let me first talk about the green school system of Bhutan very briefly. Now, what happens, uh, the green school system is that uh, 
the basic idea of the system is that whatever texts that are taught inside a classroom, for instance in, in schools and colleges, how to utilize that learning in the practical context immediately? How to utilize that learning within a very, within a very practical space? And uh, now let us say, for example, students are learning about agriculture. Now, when they're reading about some sort of agricultural practice, they are reading about agricultural practices in the textbooks. And uh, once they read about those agricultural practices in the textbooks, they're also for instance, taught how to prepare different form of manuals and fa uh, fertilizers in the laboratories. But also the question comes up that once we prepare it to understand the impact of it, how do we practically understand what are the impact apart from reading things in the book? So what happens? It's a mandatory thing for all the schools in Bhutan that they will have agricultural fields inside their school campus. Uh, they will have fruit orchards inside their school campus. They will have animal farming spaces inside the school campus. And very interestingly, uh, they are actually curated and done by the students and the teachers. It's not somebody from outside, they do that. So what basically, and the purpose of doing it centrally is that, okay, they are learning about animal farming in the books. They are learning about agriculture in the books. They are learning about the goods and bads and the odds of different fruits, growing fruits. But also, apart from learning them in the classrooms and the laboratories, they are also, you know, what is interesting, they are also investing that knowledge practically by building their own, uh, you know, green school, by building their own agricultural fields, by preparing their own fruit orchards, by taking care of animals in the animal farming spaces, and that is how they learn, number one. Number two, it is so decentered and de hierarchical in nature because it is not just that the Teachers are standing and saying, okay, you do this, you do that. They're not just standing and viewing or dictating. It is the students and the teachers who collaborate. So it's about a very collaborative and co-creative in nature as well. And it is also about co-learning. That is where we are learning from each other. It's not that somebody is dictating and somebody is taking down notes and the story is over. And um, another very interesting practice of these schools is because if you ever go to Bhutan, what you see is, apart from the city of Thimphu, which is the capital city of Bhutan, uh, the rest of all the cities, they are like all placed within nature, within the natural environment. And Bhutan has this very strict rule that 60% of the country has to be covered with forest. I mean, earlier it was 70%, but now people have protested because they are unable to do anything if, if the country is 70% covered with forest. So now it has been reduced to 60, but that's it. So wherever you go to Bhutan, apart from Thimphu, that also to a certain extent, which looks a bit, you know, like one of those modern cities, uh, everywhere it's forest. So, you know, every school in Bhutan, it's like, apart from Thimphu, every school in Bhutan is like located in the geographically rural spaces. And uh, so they have this very interesting practice that uh, once a month, it's a rule, once a month they are going to invite community elders from the nearby villages to come and tell the students about the values of indigenous knowledge systems uh, in the contemporary era. So they come, they invite them, they have sessions, and it's at least once a month you can do more than that as well. So you see, I mean, that is, you have once, it, it's not that they are doing away with everything. It's not that they are doing away with all the curriculums and the pedagogies because let's be practical. We, we need modern sciences, we need uh, modern sciences and technologies, but the question is who's modern science? I mean, modernism is not just the Eurocentric Western modernism. This is also modern in their own ways. Indigenous communities also have whatever they have, it is modern in their own way. It is about a kind of creating a blended pattern. It's not about doing away with things because we have to be practical as well, like rejecting ideas, rejecting knowledges. Obviously, selectively it is required, but just we say when we often we talk about decolonization, we, we get flowed by over radicalism, as I put it. You know, where we think that we will reject everything and we will start a new thing. It sounds excellent, but it's not practically doable. Let's, let's be practically do it. What can we do? It's not about everything rejecting and throwing out everything, but also 
rather than rejecting, how about generating an invitational space where let us see how we can work together with each other without trying to generate hierarchies. And the green school system setup is actually is such a kind of vibrant example towards that. And interesting, I, I tell you, now you must be wondering, okay, great, um, that also sounds, that might sound interesting to many of us, but what impact has created? Uh, let me give you one small example. Uh, and obviously, you know, today we were having a conversation with Su Ming that, you know, how she was about to come to Bhutan once in 2020, but the border closures started and, you know, all those sort of COVID um, things. Uh, till the fourth wave, Bhutan had like COVID infections in two digits, like 23 people, 24 people, when the world was like, you know, facing severe challenges with COVID of, you know, with medicines and all sorts of vaccines, nothing's taking place. Still the third wave, Bhutan was having COVID like 23, 24, 25, maximum it went to 96, 97. One of the major reasons, despite so much of infrastructural challenges, because if you are in the mountains, you just can't rush with the car. Uh, hospitals, health centers, they are not nearby. I mean, you must be having an idea that in a mountain region, if it is a 10 kilometers distance, that's quite a lot. It's not that you can just rush a car and reach a place. Uh, we had all sorts of closures in place. You know, shops were closed, uh, you know, gates, university gates were closed because in 2020, I was there entirely stuck in Bhutan, unable to go back to my home, India. Uh, and because the borders were closed, the districts were closed, but not for a single day we had challenges with getting access to groceries. Not for a single day we had challenge with, ex you know, having access to medicines. Uh, especially when, when the countries across the world we were hearing problems with hoarding and all those sort of challenges. You know, a certain section they're just hoarding things and a certain section are unable to have access to things. And another reason is, this again, you see a location to this green school system. This green school system embeds them within them these values of nature, these values of caring and sharing to such an extent that even within their houses, if you especially go to the village areas in Bhutan, even within their houses, they have massive plots of land. They have massive plots of land, but they won't complete it with like everything with a house. They will always spare a part of the land to grow some sort of vegetables. Some sort of vegetables will be there. Somebody is growing cabbage, somebody is growing spinach, somebody is growing cauliflowers, etc. And in terms of this crisis, every villager would share things with each other. Now, these have not been taught to them on, in the geographical books. These have not been taught to them in social studies. You know, they have imbibed these values from the natural environment. And that is what, you know, that is their version of common sense. And that should be all our version of common sense, that is caring and sharing. Knowledge values that needs to be cared and shared. And, uh, I mean, obviously I, I can go on and on with examples from the Green School, but also I would like to cite another uh, example, and that is with respect to, uh, you know, what is it called? Uh, yeah, the happiness curriculum in New Delhi in 2019 I was talking about. Uh, now this happiness curriculum was launched actually in 2019 for the government schools in New Delhi. It was launched by the government uh, education ministry of New Delhi. And it was meant for the students from standard one to standard seven. Now, what is a part of this happiness curriculum? Some of the parameters of this happiness curriculum is obviously to have a very student-centric pedagogy where students will take in charge of the classrooms and a very question-centric pedagogy where Asking questions would be encouraged rather than stopping them from asking questions, asking questions would be encouraged. And also, another important thing that they invite is meditation as one of their periods. Meditation as one of the part of the curriculum where they need to sit, they meditate, and they try to imbibe the value of silence. And meditation is a very strong part, a strong portion of the, of the happiness curriculum where they are taught that it is always not necessary that if we have to learn from each other, we have to always be in verbal ways of communicating. We can sit in silence, we can observe through our body languages, through our 
attitudes, through our presence, through our facial expressions, and that is also a lot of ways through that what we can learn. So to um, to diversify this whole process of learning, because you know, unlike you know uh, the the very again the very Eurocentric education system where we are. You know, especially we have been talking since morning about this whole neoliberal education system. And if I just add the right wing element to this whole neoliberal thing, where you're just taught to shout at the top of your voice and keep shouting, and when you try to look at some contents, you see it's zero. You know, you just keep shouting, you keep shouting, and you keep shouting, and your intention of shouting is to silence the people who are making sense. So again, it's a very contrary to this neoliberal education system uh, where you are being. Taught that you know here you are taught that imbibe silence, try to speak values, try to understand each other even in terms of silence. And a very you know interesting example actually it came across from the happiness curriculum. You know uh, again when I was you know doing my field work, and that that example you know kind of uh, appealed to me so much. Let us take and again I don't know if it is there. In the education system, school education system outside India, but uh, you know it is there in the education system. Lunch time used to be a very important part of a life because you know lunch time is where you know you have brought all sorts of tiffins from home and you open and you share with each other. And 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 this sharing is not just about you know sharing foods, but also it's about sharing cultural values because you know you have students from so many different types of family and cultural backgrounds. They bring different types of food. You get a taste of each food. And when you share the food, you know, uh, every time the teachers would tell us that don't talk uh, while you eat. You know, concentrate on the food, what you're eating. Concentrate on the taste. This is concentration is not just about on the food. This concentration is not just about the taste, but also you know you learn a lot of knowledge through that kind of sharing because through the taste you try to understand the ingredients that are there in that particular food item in that preparation. You try to understand what are those ingredients. You try to imbibe the values of those ingredients. You try to think the good sides and the bad sides of those ingredients. Uh, if this food is healthy, what is a healthy food? What is an unhealthy food? So you know, this is a whole sort of scientific questioning. This is a whole sort of cultural questioning which we are able to do in a very silent and performative way, where maybe we are not talking to each other. Maybe we are not just reading a few set of textbooks, but Through taste, through understanding the ingredients, we are able to understand what could be the contents in that food. What could be those the 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 impact of those content in that food? What kind of impact is creating on our palates, on our bodies, on our minds, on our health? So it's a lot a lot of important questioning that enables us, and this is again a very you know interesting and integral part of the happiness curriculum that. You see, these are very practical. These are very simple. These are very doable. These are very practical sorts of knowledges. But also, it kind of you know, uh, kind of questions this this whole sort of you know educational system. This kind of so prominently questions the mainstream sort of education system. But um, now the the question is, as I say, I've talked about common sense and I've talked about science. Now. Uh, What I do is when I am talking about the question of stupidity, here is as I mentioned at the beginning with respect to my experiences that you know uh, I have always been noted as a stupid guy because I used to ask a lot of questions. You know, don't ask a lot of questions. You are asking a lot of questions. A very common experience for many of us. You know, or at this age you are not supposed to ask so many questions. Keep shut and listen. When you grow to this age, you are allowed to ask questions. A very common experience is again in many families that you are a kid, you are small, you you have to gain certain age, certain status, certain stature to be capable of asking questions, and that is not just my experience. I mean, many people, many people around me I have seen who asked, who have been asking, who still ask relevant questions, but they are being connotated as stupid because they are asking so many questions. Now, um, and this is something which is, and why it is so historically embedded? Because, as I have already mentioned, that is something a very, uh, you know, a, a thing about the very Euro modern academic system, where you know, uh, whosoever questions, like for instance, uh, I think uh, who was talking about this? Was it 
was it Urmitopa? And I think I, it was at the time of Urmitopa as well, and prior to that, during the panel discussion as well, that certain sets of knowledges uh, that are being kind of patented and filtered through the Western ideologies and Western spaces are kind of indoctrinated. And once one reaches that state of you know indoctrination, by default, you know that person or school of thought transitions into a realm of the unquestionable. Once it has been sanctioned by the West, it's unquestionable. It's there. You can't question. Now, the moment you start questioning, you know there have to be they have to find out ways to silence you. And again, you know, uh, that's why, you know, in, in many spaces, often I would see during, as a student in the classroom, that, you know, you were asking a lot of stupid questions. Don't ask the stupid questions. How do you classify your question as stupid? Just because I am unable to respond to that question? Just because on many occasions, uh, my ways of thinking has been challenged? That's why immediately I have to silence that. Because I have to maintain my hierarchy on the podium. So I need to silence that and I immediately denounce that question as stupid. And that is what I have personally encountered. I have seen a lot of my friends encountering this. And that is what, you know, uh, emerges as my argument as the pedagogy of the stupid. Because, you know, the thing is, what does exactly stupidity mean to me? Uh, it means that, you know, I am asking a certain set of questions. Uh, if if I'm if uh, if I'm asking questions like you know uh, I'm asking the Eurocentric notions of common sense, I'm asking questions about the ownership of knowledge systems. That makes me stupid. I am asking uh, that who owns the knowledge spaces. That makes me stupid. Then it's great. I mean, if asking these questions make me a stupid, makes me a nonsense, uh, then I'm happy to be stupid because you know it is these questions. And, and, and many other questions that has been enabling me and many individuals around me to engage with and open up various diverse, uh, universal, de-hierarchical and, and various decolonial avenues of knowledge production and most importantly, you know, to keep the conversations going in an inconclusive way. Uh, you know, if asking these questions, you know, uh, makes me stupid, then it's fine because it has been encouraging me to engage in a form of self-confession every time that when I walk into the classroom, if I'm teaching a subject, it doesn't mean that I know every end of that subject. It might happen, somebody asks me a question, I fail to respond. I can be humble and respectful enough to tell that person that it's an in interesting, encouraging question. Immediately I don't have a response, let, let, let me read more on that come back to you some other time, rather than putting out my ego, putting out my all sorts of negative energies and trying to silence that person, oh, this is a stupid question, just because I haven't been able to respond to that question. Um, in the, in the, in the mo morning, uh, you know, Epiphania was talking about this very interesting idea about disciplinary decadence, and, and Lewis Gordon actually has another very interesting idea, and it's actually... Uh, called the pedagogical imperatives. And this pedagogical imperative is that kind of confession that where you walk into the classroom with this idea that you don't know everything, every day is a new way, and every teacher is a learner and every learner is a teacher. It is always just because I have a position of a lecturer or a professor or an assistant professor and somebody sitting out there is an honor student or a master's student or a PhD student, by default, the Eurocentric academic system tells us that I know more than anybody here because that person is lower in terms of professional status, which is again a very problematic thing. And also, it is these questions that have been encouraging me not only with the self confessions but um, it is these questions which actually also allows me to seek knowledge in a very unprejudiced manner. Uh, not always in the forms of statements, but in the forms of questions and counter-questioning uh, counter as well. Not always in a very vocal way, but also through silence as well. And, and uh, I, will, I will actually, you know, conclude so that, you know, we also have some time for questions. Uh, 
is with another example. Uh, when I was teaching in Bhutan, you know, I was teaching one of the modules uh, with the postgraduate students of English literature. It's called Eco Criticism. And, uh, you know, we had this very interesting creative assignments. Uh, we did not do uh, much of written assignments. Uh, what we did is the students were like divided into groups, like they got divided into groups. And they did some kind of practical assignments, like for example, cons constructing a small greenhouse in the campus, constructing a small eco-friendly park space inside the campus, constructing natural dark outs where <coughs> garbages can be put in and closed to increase the fertility of the soil. And such kind of activities were assigned and the students were actually, uh, you know, analyzed, their works were analyzed based on those activities, which actually on the one hand, obviously they read text and whatever theories was there as, as a part of the module, but at the same time, they also got a scope to apply these theories into these spaces. And when you engage in these spaces, you know, all these sorts of questions, all these sorts of silence, all these diverse forms of silent, uh, you know, common sense, coordinate with each other to create these collective spaces where you don't imprison yourself into a fixed set of pedagogies, but you engage with multiple sorts of pedagogies which have not only been invited uh, from the books or, 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 or a certain set of texts, but also have been taken in uh, with respect to what they have received from their ancestors, from their community elders with the passage of time. Thank you.